In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it is good to be with you today. I was really pleased when I heard that you were uh, taking on Catherine Scott as one of your many missionaries. I walked down the hallway there of your mission of your mission profiles. It was good to see everybody there, to know that you are mission-minded, that you think of more than just right here in this church or even in Oromocto, but that you're around the world and you're centric on making sure that Jesus Christ is heard and seen. A quick update on uh, Catherine is that she is in, um, she is, uh, has landed in Guatemala on the weekend, last weekend, and uh, she got there, I think it was Saturday morning, and they put her to work on Sunday morning, and she was sharing her testimony in the church right away as she begins to learn her Spanish, and she's trying to figure it all out, but we make sure that she's being seen and getting out there and being able to be used by God to share what God has done in her life and how many of you have been praying for her and thinking about her. So thank you so much for that. I, uh, I ran into a, I don't know, it was back in the early 90s. I was pastoring a church, and my worship team came to me. They said, we got a new song. I don't know if you understand, but when pastors hear a worship team saying, we got a new song, most of us go into a little bit of a panic mode because we don't know what the song is. And that, back in the 90s, was the time of the worship war. So anything that wasn't him was just a little suspect. So we had to work through some of those things. And we came up with a song back there, and it's going to be around the scripture that we're speaking and opening today. And it's a fairly deep, theologically sound song. Allow me to sing it to you. If you know it, join me. You won't want to let me sing very long. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. Well done. <laughs> and we'll stop it there. But that was the song. I panicked. But we managed to sing it. And every time I've sang this song to churches, almost every somebody's always joined me. <laughs> Run along with me and help me along the way. But the song goes on. It says, I don't want to be a goat. Nope. Don't want to be a goat. Nope. Haven't got any hope. Nope. I don't want to be a goat. Nope. Don't want to be a hypocrite. Don't want to be a hypocrite because they're not hip with it. Don't want to be a hypocrite. <laughs> Pretty bad, eh? <laughs> don't want to be a Pharisee, because they're not fair, you see. Don't want to be a sad, you see, because they're too sad, you see. I just want to be a child of God. I just want to be a child of God, walking the same path he trod. I just want to be a child of God. There is something about just being a child of God. Just wanting to be that son, that daughter, walking along with my God, walking the same path he trod, a sheep whose soul is kept by the Lord himself. It's a rather interesting chorus. I hope it stays with you the rest of the day. I know I sang it to my wife late at night, and she thanked me in the morning for keeping her up all night. It's one of those ones that comes back. But anyways... Our scripture passage this morning is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. It's a one-off passage, and it's called a pericope because of that. Just one-off. You won't find it anywhere else. It just kind of sits there on its own. So you have to be a little careful when you're handling one-off passages because there's no other support behind them, and you want to make sure that they're solid. And so you don't hang all of your apples on this one particular branch. However... There's a lot to learn from it. It's a strong passage. It's found in Matthew 20, 30, 25, like I say. It is also a passage at the end of a chapter where Jesus is chastising the ruling religious leaders. He is just, he, if you were Jewish at that time, you would look at Jesus and you go, oh, because he's, that's what he's doing to you in this passage. He is really upset with the Sadducees. He's really upset with the Pharisees. He's really upset with the Jewish people in general because they have not been following what he's told them to do. He is, they have not been following God. They have made religion the center of the world, and they have forgotten the people for what it's about. So it's a very 
impactful passage, especially if you're Jewish. But for you and I, it's a really meaningful message because it reminds us of why we are here. So the passage goes, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate the people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and put the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the beginning of the world. For when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. When the righteous, then the righteous will answer them, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. It is a wonderful passage in so many ways. But one of the things I love about the passage is it is just so straightforward. It doesn't say, to be a Christian, you must understand all these things, and then you must do this and this and this, and then you must be that. To be a really well-grounded Christian, you have to do this, this, this. No, it's just right there. Help people. Be nice. That's really what it's about, isn't it? See somebody hungry, you feed them. See somebody thirsty, you give them something to drink. A stranger, clothing, sick, in jail. It's common sense to us in a Christian world when we listen to it and obey it. We just don't always do that. But it's good for us to learn about it. R.T. France writes that the guilt of the cursed arises not so much from doing wrong things, but the failure to do right. We are always looking for what somebody's done wrong. It's so easy. Oh, did you see her? It's so easy for us to find what somebody's done wrong or to point it out in our own lives. It's so quick for me to rip myself apart for what I have done wrong. But God's more interested in what I've done right. He's really interested when Randy finally did the right thing. And he remembered somebody. I have a pastor right now. It's really interesting to be a pastor for 25 years and all of a sudden leave the pulpit and go with missions because now I have a pastor. It's really interesting. So I get to roast the pastor on Sunday lunch hour. But... I don't. I spend very, a lot of time not doing that. But Pastor John turned around a while back, and he looked at the congregation in the audience. He said, what would happen if you were 10% nicer than you are now? 10% nicer. One out of 10 times when you could have done something, what if you actually did it? I thought, whoa. That would make a difference, wouldn't it? Just being nicer. In the world around us, it makes a difference. So I'll leave that little challenge with you. The passage is a joy because it is so clear. Just learning to look around you to help where you can. So I want to give you a bunch of history. I I just jarred into this sort of. But essentially, 150 years ago, a bunch of churches just like this one were sitting there realizing that while they had managed to sort of settle themselves in the country in which we are settlers, we managed to realize that there were other countries around the world who hadn't heard about Jesus yet, who knew nothing of the church, who knew nothing of what Jesus could do in their lives and how he could change them. And so we decided 150 years ago, a bunch of scrawny little churches starting down, well, actually we're always together, but started down in Kansas area. And a woman by the name of Hannah Mariah Norris decided that she was being called by God to go to Burma as a missionary. And those churches down there formed a little group together, the the Baptist women actually, and they sent her over to Burma. 
And they began missions 150 years ago. But what it is about was churches, just like ours, working together with other churches to do mission around the world. And that's how CBM came to be. We are really a denominational mission organization run by our churches. And so we want to just, that's an amazing part of our history. But because we wanted to be kind to the rest of the world, because we needed to go out to the rest of the world, we work in 17 different countries right now, 18 different countries, depending how you count them. But we're working in Kenya and Rwanda and South Sudan, India, China. Bolivia is one of our oldest works, and it's well over 100 years, one of the poorest countries in South America. A very isolated community, but uh, we do some great work down there. And the Caribbean, where uh, Catherine Scott is going to be working down in Guatemala and in Latin America. So we work in a number of different countries and we want to thank you for your support as in those countries one of the more interesting countries we work in is in Germany and you say well why do we work in Germany well if you want to reach Chinese students you go to Germany because many Chinese students go to Germany for their university education and we basically have host homes there where we can welcome them in and help them to to acclimatize to uh, Germany many of them come to our worship services at our church and come to know the Lord and take that with them back into Germany back through their schools so it's an interesting kind of evangelistic ministry that we're doing in Germany one of the key principles of doing mission well is what's called word deed it's the concept that at no time should the word of God be presented to a group of people without helping them, without doing a deed of God. You can't say, you need Jesus, and then watch them as they're starving. You can't help people come to know the Lord if you're not going to help them physically as well. But you also can't just keep feeding people and not ever challenge them on Christianity. So how do you do that? It's a difficult challenge, but we call it word deed. And basically, they both happen at the same time in different ways. And so we praise God that we've been able to do our mission work that way, through word and deed. We work in about five major causes. Poverty, of course, is one of the, the biggest areas we work. Poverty can be alleviated. Just because you're dealing with a poor country doesn't mean they're always going to be poor. If you were ever in, in, uh, the, on the prairies in the 1800s, you would see poverty, extreme poverty. And yet, now the prairies of Canada are doing well. They're, they're prosperous. You, have, you can work out of poverty. So we work in a lot of areas of poverty. Justice. If you see an issue out in the world and you say, that just ain't fair. When you get that just ain't feeling in you, that's a justice issue. And so remember that because it's not a hard word, but there's so much injustice in the world that we work with constantly. Kids at risk, all of our children. Building the church, probably one of the biggest works that we do is building the local church and also emergency relief. So those are our five causes that we work together on. So I want to open those up a little bit for you. Here's some poverty issues. Um, this is one, this slide I have kept in here. I hope you didn't see it three years ago. If you did, too bad. It's a good slide. And the reason it's a good slide is because it shows poverty in one of its best. So up in the corner, you have the, uh, the African father sitting with his children, and there's green vegetables growing beside him. If you're living on a diet primarily of white, whether it be rice or bread or, not, or flour, but not much green in it, you need nutrients. And so what we do all around the world is we teach people how to grow very simple garden um, kitchen gardens. So all of the food that you can use in your kitchen, you can cut up and make things out of from carrots to turn up to whatever. And in many countries, it's a whole different type of vegetable than we're accustomed to. But we teach people to do kitchen gardens. And it changes lives because people then start to eat better, they feel better, and they're actually able to produce quite well out of these gardens. They actually sell things from those gardens, and that helps them economically. It helps them to move on through. The woman in the middle is my superhero. I don't know her name. I don't know where I got the picture from. I know it's our picture. But the thing is, is she is repeated time after time. Every year, she is a repeated figure. So she is a person who represents all of the women and all of the men who received a chicken. Because in our hopeful gifts for change catalogs, around Christmas time, people buy chickens. You remember the chickens? You'll see them in there. You buy the chickens. And they gave, we gave a chicken to this woman. Well, she knew, figured out how chickens worked. And so she got eggs from the chicken. And then she got poultry from the chicken. And then she got more eggs from the chicken. And then she got more poultry. Chickens do what chickens do. And she let them do it. And before long, she had enough that she could buy a goat. So now she has milk. 
and goats doing goat things and chickens doing chicken things and before long she was actually becoming quite successful as a farmer so successful that she could go out and buy a cow when she bought the cow she has what's now known as a bank on the hoof because the local bankers will actually lend her money so that she can make a little bigger barn or she can buy medicine that she needs or she can get that loan she needs for whatever her issue is because she's being shown as a successful farmer because chickens do what chickens do and goats do what they do and the cow is kind of the pinnacle but she has the cow just kind of this way of helping people out of poverty and to do well because many people can they just need the start and sometimes it's just chickens and then of course we have the woman up in the corner there sometimes we have poverty and you just have to work with food but you'll see a little energy packs in there that help to give nutrition to her family and that's sometimes the only way we can really help in severe situations so those are the ways that we help people out of poverty and help them get started. And there are so many other ways, uh, from sewing to, well, let's check the next one. Yeah, uh, Bolivia. Uh, Bolivia is a honey project right now. We just developed a while this last year. And the people in Bolivia are struggling, and they, they do a lot of work around potatoes. Uh, there's over 300 types of potatoes, and there's potatoes coming off the field every month of the year in Bolivia. But... They wanted to open it up a bit wider, help us do something that everybody else isn't doing, and they came up with honey. And they're doing great with these honeybees, with the hives and starting to a whole process situation, and that develops confidence, it develops the finances, does all kinds of neat things. So helping poverty on fairly base levels, but it makes this huge difference. Because whatever you did for one of the least of these, just because somebody looks poor, they are every bit as loved in God's eyes. God wants to help them, and we can help them. Justice, embracing dignity, challenges, inequity. The world is really unfair. And if you happen to be born in much of the world as a female, you're going to really struggle. I have a friend of mine who said, you know, sometimes CBM says that we are all about women's issues. We're not really about women's issues. We're about human rights issues for women. Because in many parts of the world, women aren't even treated at the basic standard levels of the UN human rights. So that's all we work at. We work a lot around a lot of women. This is in Rwanda, and uh, this is a literacy project. Uh, she's one of our graduates, and basically they learn to read, write, and do arithmetic. And it takes about six months to give that sort of basic outline. And so then they have enough that they realize, if I buy something for five cents, I need to sell it for 10 cents, not the other way around. Because when you don't know math, you buy things for 10 cents and you sell it for five because the coin's bigger. Not good, not good. So they learned to do this and it worked really well. And in fact, they were doing so well, usually they end up harvesting stuff. Uh, but in their culture, so harvest time is coming, the women have big plans because women have big plans, right? And they want their family to do well. So they want to buy the, the uniforms for their kids, and they want to get them into school, and they want good things for their family, and they want to buy that new thing in their kitchen or whatever it is. But then husband shows up just at harvest time, just after the produce has been sold, and he says, where's my money? And in his culture, it is his money. And she has to pass it over. So what happened was those women came back to CBM, well, not to CBM, but to our partner, and they said, thanks a lot. I've just worked my buns off all summer to get this produce in. Now husband's taken it, and he's bought a truck. It did not help us out the way it was supposed to help out. So what we did was we started, um, the Buston family that's there, they started a, a um, marriage 101. And they took couples who really communicated well from the churches, and they brought them together, and they taught them marriage 101. They taught communication. They taught about family values. They taught about sex. They taught about all these different things that were really important. And so what came to be really funny to me, anyways, because I'm kind of like this, so they decided that they needed to get everybody into these classes. So these people were taught the marriage 101. They went back to their churches to teach marriage 101 so that when the harvest came next year, everybody would be on the same page kind of thing. And so they decided the very first class should be the class on sex education because they knew they'd get the guys there. So they got the guys out, everything worked fine, and they grew again. 
And they've had great success. Last five years, they've been doing this marriage enrichment class, and there's a change happening. And so there's much more hope when the women go through the basic education that they're going to come out the other end okay. It's, it's, it's a huge world, and injustice is all around, and it's really basic. I hope he didn't mind the little sex introduction. It's just that it usually catches everybody's attention like it did the guys there. Moving on. <laughs> My wife's never sure if I should use it or not. Anyways, and then uh, here's a peacemaking camp, and uh, the young man sitting there teaching peace to the other kids. He was once one of those kids. And over years, he grew up, he came to the Lord, he went to church, and now he's starting to work in the peace camps as well. So some really interesting things, because you have to teach peace in some countries, because tribalism is so strong, and you have to work on that. And in fact, Canada has to work on that too at times. Whatever you did for the least of these, Kids at risk, there's always children. So many children at risk around the world. Um, they say right now there's six, that there's 89.3 million people who are forcibly displaced around the world, and of those, 41% are children. So children are displaced, they are at the bottom end of things, they are often struggling just to survive, and we do a huge amount of work around our children in the world. Uh, the top one, left-hand corner is a, is a classroom for three to five-year-olds. We try to get them to this little sort of pre-kindergarten, preschool, especially for the poorest kids, because once they go to a regular school, they don't have the advantages of the of the children who may have been a little better off. And so we teach them basics and get them sort of ready to be socialized and stuff. And while we do that, the mothers are often sitting around the outside of the school looking in because Filipino mothers don't like to let their children out of their sight. So they, they tend to learn and we're able to share Christ with them. And the child in the middle, I think, is from Bolivia and, and Africa. Just uh, We do a lot of work around schools, around keeping kids safe after and before schools, and just helping them on their way. Whatever you did for the least of these. And then building the church, we teach a lot. <laughs> Our work together, we found out very early on that if you're going to tell people about Christ and they're going to start churches, they're going to need their own pastors. And the problem is, in many countries of the world, pastors are very poorly educated to begin with, and they have even less theological education, but they may end up leading several churches all at the same time. So our big concern is to make sure that, that pastors have, are educated and at a decent level. And so we spend a lot of our resources helping pastors become theologically literate and strong. Because if they are, they can lead their churches. And if they lead their church as well, they will share the gospel with those people who are around them, and Christ's name will go forward. But you need strong pastors. You always need a strong pastor just to work ahead. It's the way God's put us together. But we get to celebrate some amazing things as we see those pastors develop and do well. And then other pastors like Lily and Yang and Pastor Tao are out in a Lahu village in, in um, um, Burma, and they're just, or Myanmar, and they're just doing some medical stuff, but they're. De- they're, they're planting churches, and there's a number of churches that have been planted in, in Burma right now, and it's growing. And so really good news there. And it's just by pastors like her and, and uh, by, by uh, Pastor Tao who just go out and share the gospel in some really tough environments. They're allowed into that little part of the Golden Triangle in the north of Thailand, and it's just a special spot where we can do some really good work. Because you want to be sharing the gospel. Whatever you did for the least, the least. And then finally, crisis response. This is something I wanted to bring you up to date on because I know that you gave to uh, Ukraine last year, and I'm sure it's on your minds and on your hearts. But this has been one of the most interesting things for us to see. We have worked in Ukraine over the years, over the last century. We've had ministries going on in Ukraine. We know the main players in Ukraine. And so when the emergency erupted, when the war erupted, instantly Canadians wanted to help support, and we knew people that were there. There were over 2,200 Baptist churches in Ukraine. And they are the largest non, uh, the largest Protestant denomination in Ukraine are the Baptists, 2,200 Baptist churches. When the war broke out, 600 of them just threw open their doors that next Sunday and said, we're open, we'll help you. And basically the doors came open and people traveling from the west, no, the east heading west, trying to escape the war, came through those churches and we helped them. And we continue to help them to this day. It's really frontline ministry because we have partnerships 
We know where the money is going. They know what to do with it. We're able to get resources into Ukraine, and it's been going well. This picture is actually of Lebanon, but same kind of ministry. And once we got the uh, refugees starting to come out of Ukraine, other Baptists kicked in, especially in Romania, and we ended up doing a, a whole lot of work uh, welcoming uh, refugees down in there. And we work with a group called All for Aid, uh, and they're building buildings and putting in places for people to stay. It's just fascinating to watch how quickly it can happen and how fast people want to just help. And when you're on site and you're able to do it, they have done amazing work. I'd love to talk to you about that at any time. But uh, to think of all those churches that have just opened their doors, like I would like to think that Oromukta would if there was a disaster, that you would just throw open your door and say, don't know how we're going to help you, but here, come on in. And then you work it out from there. There's, over, there's hundreds of uh, van loads coming in to the Ukraine and being distributed throughout those churches. CBM is small enough, and so is some of the Baptist work, that we're small enough, we kind of just slip in underneath the covers. They don't notice us very much. We're just another van going in, uh, as opposed to some of the big guys. When they move around, everybody's stopping them. There's all kinds of issues. Just small work, but it's getting done. And so hands on the ground there. So we've just been able to be really effective during emergency response over the years. So I just wanted you to know that. And again, food comes everywhere, and shelter, and people just helping where we can. Those are the vans that we were using and some of the shelter that was, uh, has been put together. And then Catherine Scott, I already mentioned to you. Uh, thank you so much for taking her on. She is uh, just a lovely uh, young woman, um, just really capable of speaking. I think she might have even have spoken here. So you, you have that idea. And keep praying for it. Right now, can you imagine? She's one week into language training. So I don't know. I know some of you probably went away for French language training at a time with a military career, and you know how confusing that was in that first couple of weeks. So you might want to remember Catherine in your prayers and think about just what she's going through. She's trying to learn Spanish, and uh, it's going to challenge her for sure. And she's also on her own, and she's got good people around her. But just, just keep praying for her, okay? So just think what you would feel like, and then make those prayers appropriate to that. Whatever you did for one of the least of these. You can connect with us on those addresses, but before I leave, I want to just give you a couple of challenges. Pray. Please pray for all things mission with CBM, with your hallway down the road there. Just pray for your missionaries. Remember, they are just like you. So they have the same joys, the same struggles, the same issues. Please remember them in your prayers and with the ministries that they're doing. I always like to challenge people to find something that really stirs them up. In our catalogs and in uh, different things, actually, I should show you the catalog that was supposed to be doing that. Okay. So this is a CBM responding catalog. There's some out there. When you give to CBM, we make sure you get this catalog because it, it's not a catalog. It actually lets you know what's happening and what we're doing around the world. So you can read those stories. You can also read them online. Go up to our, face, our, our website, and it's really strong there. And then this is Hopeful Gifts for Change. These are gifts that you can use all year long. Uh, this is where you buy the chickens and many other things. So keep those in mind. But find something that really gets you going, that really gets you upset. I, uh, I ran into, there's all kinds of stories in there, but I, I, like, I don't like the idea that people go to bed hungry. So chickens always gets my attention. Just that concept of really simple food things. But find something that is your passion and see what you can work on. It might be kids that need education. It might be adults that need, need hope in their, in their businesses or whatever and work on that. Just wanted you to know that 85% of anything you give to Canadian Baptist Ministries goes straight to the project. 15% is for administration. That covers people like me. But more importantly, it covers the people overseas who actually watch over the projects to make sure that they're happening as they're supposed to. So, and 100% of anything you give to a partner in mission like Catherine goes directly to her, to her work. I'd like to uh, just keep you, uh, keep reminding you to, uh, Keep mission on your foreground. Keep thinking about it, because it's something that often gets lost in the, in the malaise of a local church. We often get kind of inward focused. I'm glad you have that hallway down there with lots of outward focused stuff, but keep that in mind as you go. And uh, I'd like to invite you to get involved in any one of our projects as the Lord leads you or your leadership team. And we have some really good things coming up for Christmas if you want to take on a Christmas project with Canadian Baptist Ministries. So it is a joy to have that information we had today to just care for others, to be nice, but to share the gospel at the same time.
So thank you for doing that. Thank you for praying for me here this morning and remembering the ministries that we are doing together with Canadian Baptist Ministries. Let me pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you ever so much for an opportunity just to be here, to be able to share the gospel, to be able to share what we are doing together. God, you have allowed CBM and Oromocto Church to do some good things over the years, and we just pray that you continue to keep us mindful of those who are in need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.